Welcome to the Bible study for Clinton Evangelical Church, the third one for the month of March. We're looking at perhaps lesser known characters in the Bible who have an impact for God. And tonight we're looking at a Josiah, a teenager that makes an impact for God. That's the first time we looked at Ahud, left-handed man. Left-handedness in those days was considered to be a disadvantage. But he was used greatly by God. Last time we looked at Deborah, a woman in a man's world, and how she was used greatly by God. Tonight we're looking at Josiah, a young boy who became king and who makes a great impact. We're reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and 35. Do you remember the story of the little Dutch boy who saved his city from destruction by sticking his finger in the hole in the dike wall to hold back the water. I wonder do you ever feel like that little boy except you are trying to plug holes with all your fingers and thumbs but more leaks are breaking out every minute. I sometimes feel overwhelmed as I look around our society, our nation and the world and we see it's a godless society hurtling towards destruction. And this boy king we're looking at tonight, King uh, Josiah, must have felt that way. He lived in an evil day. His culture was on the brink of God's judgment. His grandfather Manasseh had been the most wicked king in Judah's history. He plunged the nation into worse sins than the Canaanites who Israel had conquered centuries before. But even though Manasseh repented, he could not undo the damage he had done. It's easier to lead people into sin than it is to lead them out again. Josiah's father, the wicked Amon, he reigned only two years before he was assassinated. He re-established the pagan practices of his father's early years. And into this wicked culture, Plunging headlong towards destruction, this eight-year-old boy, Josiah, was thrust as king. What could this boy king do? We see he stuck all his fingers in the holes. Let's read. We won't read uh, both chapters, but some parts of it. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek God, the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images and the moulded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the, and the insult, incense altars which were above them. He cut down and the wooden images, the carved images and the moulded images, he broke in pieces and made them to dust and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burnt the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim and Simeon as far as Naphtali and all around with axes. When he broken down the altars and the wooden images and beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. In verses 8 to 14 are a des description of the repairs he made to the temple. And then in the last part of verse 14 we read, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. 
And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed, your servants, they are doing. And they have gathered the money, and have found in the house of the, they have found in the house of the Lord, and have delivered it into the hands of the overseers and the workmen. And Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest was, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And so it happened, when the king heard the words of the Lord, that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Anakim the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Azariah the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and Judah, concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord, to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Holder, the prophetess, the wife of Sh Shalem, the son of Tokaf, the son of Hashra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. Then she answered them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place, on its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me, and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place. And not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and you wept before me, I also have heard you, said the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought word back to the king. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel. And he made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. In chapter 35 verse 1, now Josiah kept the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem and they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day of the first month. Then the next few verses from verses 2 to 17 they give a instructions and description of this Passover. In verse 18 we read there had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. With the priests and the Levites, all of Judah and Israel who were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, this Passover was kept. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho the king of 
Egypt came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates and Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him saying, What have I to do with you, King of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Refrain from meddling with God who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and did not heed the words of Necho from, from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo, and the archer shot King Josiah. And the king said to her servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in a second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. And so he died. And he was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all of Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. And to this day all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel, and indeed they are written in, in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness according to what was written in the law of the Lord, and his deeds from first to last, indeed they are written in the book of the, the kings of Israel and Judah. Let's look again at these verses and see if we can work out what is happening to Judah at this time. Josiah, just like Joash who came before him, came to the throne at a very young age. He grew up to institute various religious reforms which would bring the people of Judah back to worship the one true God. Josiah's ascension to the throne at the age of eight was not as dramatic as um, that of Joash, but it followed the assassination of his father Amon at the hands of a group of disgruntled conspirators, who themselves were later put to death. You can read that for yourselves in the previous chapter, uh, verses 24 and 25. Josiah would be king of Judah for 31 years. When he was 16, Josiah seems to made, make a real commitment to serve God. We read that in verse 3. He began to seek the God of his father, David. And he sought him for wisdom and for guidance in his life. Four years later, at the age of 20, Josiah's personal commitment began to impact the kingdom. He ordered and he directed the destruction of all pagan worship, that which had crept into the land during the reign of his father Amon and his grandfather Manasseh, verses 3 to 7. Later this purge would be carried out more fully after the discovery of the book of the law in the temple. It's very interesting that the year when King when Josiah, the young Josiah became king, he began his purge. Jeremiah was also called by God to be a prophet. And Jeremiah was very reluctant to accept his calling because he was young. But God assured Jeremiah that age didn't matter. And God assured Jeremiah that he would give him words to speak. We can see this for ourselves if we look in the opening chapter of Jeremiah, and particularly verses 2 and 6 to 10. So here we have two young men dedicated to the service of God, ministering in Judah at the same time, and both would have a massive impact on the nation. We should ask ourselves the question, do we encourage the ministry of young people in our churches. It's so easy to look down upon them and to belittle them. Yes, they will make mistakes due to lack of experience, but isn't it better to guide them and to help them and to develop them 
than to criticise them unfairly and curtail their activities. No one is too young to serve God. Consider the fact that being young means they are probably more teachable, but as we're growing older, we can get stubborn in our ways. We think we know it all. Those who are young are teachable. And who knows the impact for God that these young people will grow to have in our society, in our nation, even in the world, if they are nurtured properly. In the 18th year of his reign, Josiah begins his program of building works to repair and restore the temple in Jerusalem to something of its former glory. We read down verses 8 to 13. But at some point during this period of restoration, Hilkiah the high priest finds the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Many people, many commentators and Bible scholars believe this may have been the book of Deuteronomy, which has seemingly been lost during the period of the evil kings of Judah. And Hilkiah sends the secretary, Shaphan, to Josiah with the book of the law. And Shaphan begins to read it to the king. And Josiah was shaken to the core by what he heard. He realised what he had started, what he had implemented so far, only scratched the surf surface of what God required of his people. Josiah tore his clothes in grief. He wept in sorrow at the failure of himself and the people to live holy lives before God as set out in this book. Josiah's conclusion was in verse 21, Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because of our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in the book. Do we live our lives in accordance with the teachings of the Bible? As we read God's word, as we hear it preached, do we, like Josiah, obey its teaching and change our ways? Josiah realised that he needed to seek the Lord about this matter. So he gets a group together, led by Hilkiah uh, the priest, to inquire of the Lord, verse 21, on his behalf. They turn to a prophetess named Hoda. And through her, God declares that the sins of the, the people down through the ages are a sin against him. And that God is angry and it will bring disastrous consequences for the nation. But because Josiah had responded in the way he had, God's judgment would not fall during his reign. His reign would be characterised by peace, which is 22 to 28. Josiah would be spared seeing the fall of Judah and Jerusalem. And this took place about 60 years after his death. Here in the contents of the book of the law spurred Josiah on in his campaign to rid the land of everything that smacked of pagan worship. Josiah was following the footsteps of his great grandfather Hezekiah who had brought the nation back to worship God. But Josiah's purge was even more extensive and even more far-reaching. It even included demolishing and defiling the high places at Bethel set up by Jeroboam. And therefore he fulfills the prophecy concerning that. We can read for ourselves in 1 Kings 13 and 2 Kings 23. Josiah was also defying the Assyrians by banning worship of their gods, not only from Judah, but also from parts of the old kingdom of Israel under Assyrian control. And even though Assyria had greater problems to worry about at that time, it was still a courageous move on the part of Josiah. It showed he was dead set on restoring the worship of the one true God. 
whatever the cost. Josiah proceeded to renew the covenant in the temple and insisted that the people pledge themselves to serve God once again. This was followed by the ark being restored to its proper place and this magnificent celebration of the Passover which was unparalleled since the time of Samuel. Chapter 35 verse 3 and 18. Unfortunately, when we read Jeremiah chapters 2 to 6, we see that although Josiah's measures and reforms were good, they never really touched the hearts and the minds of the people. The people went along with the king more out of respect for him rather than because they shared his convictions. And then we come to this battle at Megiddo. In the 28th year of Josiah's reign, the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, captured the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Three years later, the Babylonians moved in force to finish off the Assyrians, who had regrouped at Carchemish. And Necho, the pharaoh of Egypt at the time, marched his army north in support of the Assyrians. This meant him passing through Judah. And Josiah regarded this as a threat against his kingdom. Despite the strong reassurances from Necho to the country, Necho even claimed that God had sent him on this mission. Verses 20 and 21. Then very surprisingly, in view of what we know about Josiah, we notice that Josiah did not consult God on this matter. He went out in disguise to do battle with this Pharaoh. Perhaps Josiah feared that if Necho and the Assyrians defeated Babylon, they would turn on Judah and divide it up between them. Whatever the reason, the battle was joined at Megiddo and Josiah was killed during the fighting. Necho went on to join the Assyrians, but the Babylonians were victorious and became the dominant power in the region. Josiah was buried in Jerusalem and Jeremiah composed laments for him, songs about him. And while his great-grandfather Hezekiah was remembered for his faith in God, Josiah was remembered for his obedience to God and to his laws. Josiah was always prepared to acknowledge sin, to deal with sin, to remove the causes of sin. Are we prepared to adopt a similar process in our lives, taking steps to avoid reading perhaps certain literature, watching certain programmes? going to certain places, being near certain people, in order to remove the possibility of temptation. So what can we learn from this boy king? How can we apply it to our lives today? The first thing we see about Josiah is that he lived in an evil day. So do we. When you read these two chapters we've read today, you begin to see what Josiah was up against. Although the people in his kingdom would claim to be followers of the one true God, they had incorporate, incorporated all sorts of worldly practice into their worship. Idolatry, sexual immorality, even child sacrifice, all under the guise of religion. In Josiah's day, as in ours, there was a widespread lack of understanding of God's word. When we read of a copy of the law being discovered in the temple and it being read to the king, we get the impression that even the godly Josiah had never heard it read before. And whenever people do not read and understand the Bible, they have no basis for evaluating or confronting their behaviour. So they drift into the worst sins without even knowing it. 
But even though, like Josiah, we live in an evil day, when even those claiming to be God's people can be marked by worldly things, there is a way out of the darkness. And it involves seeking the Lord and obeying his word. And that's the second thing we see about Josiah. He sought the Lord. He obeyed his word. And so can we. Josiah sought the Lord, verses 30, uh, chapter 34, verse 3. There's lessons for us to learn here and to notice. Seek the Lord early in life if you can. Josiah was 16 when he began to sought, seek the Lord. He was not from a godly home. He lived in an evil day. And yet he began to seek the Lord during his teen years and he never turned away. Keep on seeking the Lord. We notice the words used. He began to seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord is a lifelong, lifelong process. You don't just try it half-heartedly for a few months or a few years and then say it didn't work. Walking with the infinite God, learning his ways, it takes a lifetime. Paul tells us we've got to run with endurance, the race set before us. With Josiah, we must keep seeking the Lord. Josiah obeyed God's words. Verse 2. Verse 2 actually summarises Josiah's life. He did right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the left or to the, to the right or to the left. There's a difference between doing right in the sight of people and doing right in, sent in the sight of the Lord, isn't there? We can only do right in the sight of the Lord when we obey his word. Josiah had, as we will have, many opportunities to turn aside to the right or to the left. But he didn't do that. He obeyed God's word. Whenever God's word is read and obeyed, great changes begin to take place in individuals and also in society. But owning copies of the Bible, keeping one on your coffee table, won't do you any good. We must read the word. We can't obey it if we don't know what it says. We must not read just our favourite scriptures, our favourite sections of scripture. Those bits that reinforce our prejudices. We must read it all. Read those parts of the Bible that steps on your toes. We must respond to the word. Josiah's response was to tear, tear his clothes in horror. Now we don't need to tear our clothes, but sometimes the word ought to break our hearts. When Josiah heard that what God said, he basically says, we are in a heap of trouble. It exposes things in our lives that are displeasing to God. We've got to take strong action against such things. Just like Josiah did in verses 4 to 5. Chop them down, break them in pieces, grind them to powder, burn it and scatter the ashes. We must seek to influence others with the word. And that's what Josiah did. Once we have read the word and responded to it with personal obedience and we have taught, taught it, and have been taught, taught it by others, we have an ob obligation to influence others with the word. Josiah didn't keep it to himself. He got everybody together. He read the word to them. He sought to help them to obey it too. If God's work in your life is real, you will want to bring others under its influence. But I can hear some people saying, I wouldn't want to offend somebody by telling them what the Bible says. But let me ask that with this. If you see someone with an illness and you have been cured, cured of that same illness by taking a certain remedy, wouldn't you tell them what you found? So even though Josiah lived in an evil day, he sought the Lord. He obeyed his word. And so can we. 
And the result was God worked through Josiah. He can work through us. Josiah purged the land of idolatry and immorality. He re-established worship in its proper place. He saved a generation from God's judgment. In the days we live, in these evil days we live, God can do great things through us if we will seek him, if we will obey his word. Although it seems impossible to see our nation restored, God can do the impossible. We need that spiritual revival. Josiah's story ends on a sad note. The pharaoh of the time of Egypt, uh, Necho, passes through Judah on his way north to Carchemish, where he tends to join the Assyrians to fight against Babylon. He did not intend to fight Josiah, but Josiah insisted on fighting him. It probably seemed like a sensible thing to do. But nowhere do we read of Josiah seeking the Lord about this battle. In fact, he disguises himself to go into battle. And this reminds us of the ploy of, used by the wicked Ahab. Why disguise yourself if you're in the will of God? But Josiah goes against Egypt. He gets shot in battle and he dies at the age of 39. The revival stops and in a few short years Judah falls to Babylon. And what this says to me is don't get sidetracked from what God has called you to do. Josiah should have stuck to his spiritual reforms. Let me finish with an illustration. At the age of 12 Robbie, Robert Louis Stevenson, who later would become the author of Treasure Island, was one evening looking out into the dark from his upstairs window. He was watching a man going up and down the street lighting the gas lanterns. And when his governess came into the room and asked him what he was doing, he replied by saying, I'm watching a man cut holes in the darkness. And though we live in a dark day, we can be used of God to cut holes in the darkness if we will seek Him and if we will obey Him. And we do it because we want to bring honour and glory to His name. Amen.